Welcome to the Vision Quest video series, a step-by-step -step guide to holistic health. This program will discuss herbalism. My name is Amanda McQuaid Crawford and I'm a medical herbalist and I was trained in Great Britain and I have a degree in nutrition as well and so I see people for a number of different kinds of conditions and I also teach a lot of classes and lecture widely. In this film, we'll cover herbal medicine and the foundations and origins of herbal medicine. We'll cover how to use herbs medicinally for common ailments, how to administer herbs, how to use herbs in chronic disease. We'll also cover how to use them with some cautions about self-care. The ancient art of herbalism dates back thousands of years where many plants were found to contain healing properties with remarkable benefits. For countless centuries, plants have been valued by many cultures more highly than jewels or precious metals. Inside their blossoms, seeds, leaves and roots are locked the secrets of life and death, the power of healing or harm, depending on how they're used. Well, a herb is perhaps, if you like, <laughs> it's a plant that has some sort of medicinal action within the body. And of course, there are many different plants that you can use that would have a medicinal action in the body, but could also have serious side effects, hemlock being one. So of course it is a herb, but it is also a dangerous herb and can certainly kill you in the process of taking it. So where I as a Western herbalist come in is that we only really use plant material that is known to be safe within the dosages that are uh, known to be uh, you know, therapeutically effective, yet have a very wide safety margin as well. We probably don't know uh, the amount of herbs that are growing on the planet at the moment because of um, devastation of environment and sprays and what have you. But um, they have particular properties in them. Um, the properties have been known for centuries. It's been well analysed, not in laboratories, but it's been well analysed by people themselves in their bodies. and. Um, been passed from one generation to another through lines of families saying, oh, this is definitely good for bronchitis, this is definitely good for gastrointestinal problems, etc. And even if you have a big fat sore toe, you have a specific herb to take the gout away. Many herbs, unlike marijuana and peacoat, are still quite legally obtainable in the Western world and can provide remarkable results for many ailments such as athlete's foot, burns, bad breath, coughs, colds, headaches, indigestion, nausea, pain relief and sore throats. I think one of the fundamental things with us as natural therapists is that we always are aiming to re-establish harmony or balance within the body. Disease is really an outcome of imbalance that has been created in the system. Now that can be due to a uh, past history of illnesses. For instance, someone gets sick, they go to hospital, they have an anesthetic, they get a lot of drugs, so that illness can already imbalance the body further, even though their appendicitis might have been cured, for instance. Um, it's their lifestyle factors. They can also create a lot of problems. So if they're on a lot of coffee, tea and alcohol and so on, that can further weaken the whole situation. So it's by using the appropriate herbal uh, products or material for each person's specific need so we can start to reharmonize and rebalance that person. And as that happens, you get automatically health. Well, first of all, of course, there's a different range of plant material or herbs that are actually used. There are herbs that come, well, each continent has their own range of uh, plant medicines, if you like. And so, of course, the Chinese have got very specific herbs that are primarily to their continent. But it's deeper than that because, really, the fundamental difference is one of philosophy. There are a lot of similarities between the Western herbs and the Chinese style of uh, herbalism, but there are also very important differences. Now, I'm not a Chinese herbalist, so I wouldn't be the one to really explain it to you, other than to say they look more at 
whether a herb has a heating effect or a cooling effect, whether it is moistening or drying of the body. And of course this is very important because each person is so different. So there's no good giving, say, a drying herb to someone who already has a dry health condition. It could really exacerbate the whole situation. So from that point of view, I think the Western herbalism is not quite as fine-tuned as the Eastern. Herbs for general health are always um, sort of used as a precaution. Um, if you're looking at winter coming up, then of course you use um, respiratory tract herbs. Old things like garlic, which has been around for centuries, you know, to ward off um, influenza and any other kind of um, sort of upper respiratory tract disease. Um, garlic is an old one, and of course um, you'd use things like colt's foot, which is also um, a very nice herb. Unfortunately, it has been put on the poisons list but this is one of these things that herbalists have to put up with. You can't just deal with the body as a whole either. You've got to deal with the kind of psychology that the individual is using in their little space, what they're doing in the world. And um, the whole body is not what we see. It's other things that are going on, and um, I don't like to put it to words because no doubt I'll be contradicted, but um, there are more things than um, tissue and blood and bone that's going on in the body. And I think that it's been said before, but I'll say it again, curling photography has looked at that very closely, uh, which shows that there are other energies that are in action, and these are the energies that herbs work on, basically. If you're talking about sort of... Um, energies that the body doesn't have, the uh, herbs will replace those energies as it heals the organ tissues or whichever problem that the body is having at that particular time. That's not to say that I would not use traditional medicine because I'd be the first person to jump into a, an ambulance had I had a car accident, for instance. Um, herbs in that instance is not going to help me, <laughs> not at that point in time. I'd prefer to have a plaster on my leg if it's broken. There's a synergistic effect with herbs. Um, it's a life force with herbs. They work with all the constituents, and some of them we don't know about. Even if they've been in the laboratories and been analysed under sophisticated technology, we still don't know about all the constituents of herbs, and never will do because some of them you can't analyze and put under a microscope. It's like the energies I was talking about previously that herbs have and the way they're extracted with ethanol retain those energies. Otherwise, people wouldn't get better. You can't eat dead things or drink dead things and expect to get better with dead things. They're still alive. There are classifications of separate systems in the body. If you're talking about upper respiratory tract herbs, then that's the herbs you'll need for things like um, sort of influenza, bronchitis, any kind of thing that's going wrong with the sinuses, ears or throats, yeah, or the lungs. And those are your, that system that you treat with those, that particular group of herbs. If you go on down the body and you're dealing with the heart, then you have a particular group of herbs that deal with the heart. Depends on what you find is wrong with the heart, although we're not allowed to treat hearts. The origins of herbal medicine, like those of many traditional therapies, dates as far back as prehistory. Herbalism has been around for as long as human beings have been around. There are history uh, sites of archaeology that have been dug up where they found that herbalism was obviously an active part of their total lifestyle. So it seems as long as herbs have been, as long as people have been around, herbs have been utilized in one way or another, either as components of food or actually as medications in situations of ill health. 
What happened then was that there came a time where science started to break down the herbs and find out exactly what was making them tick, and then decided that, well, you can make a lot more money if you can actually isolate some of those active ingredients, patent them, and then sell them back as a tablet or a synthesized form. And so modern medicine was born. And of course, certain things like penicillin uh, were absolute boons to humanity because they saved a lot of people from dying. But the problem is that we tend to forget that modern medicine is really the new kid on the block. It's only been around for 150 to 200 years. And even if you go back to the pharmacopoeias, those are the, if you like, the cookbooks of drugs that the orthodoxy uses. If you go back to some of these old pharmacopoeias, you find out that actually a lot of the medicines that were used even a century ago were based on plants. So plants were really the original form of medications and have established themselves over thousands of years of usage in millions of people with remarkable safety. There are some quite horrendous statistics actually uh, when you compare, for instance, the amount of side effects that you get from the orthodox drugs compared to the side effects that you might get from plant uh, medications. There are more people killed from side effects of their medically prescribed drugs. I'm not talking about street drugs, I'm talking about medically prescribed drugs in the United States each year than there are people killed by motor accidents in the United States. So just think about that for a moment. And just, you can understand how many people are actually killed in the state from motor accidents. And there are many times more people actually killed from the drug side effects. Now, herbal medications are remarkably safe because they don't contain just one isolated substance which has been grossly purified and then very much potentized and then put back into the body. A plant contains a whole soup of material. And even though one or two substances in there, if isolated, might cause a problem. In the total milieu, if you like, of that whole substance, it has a therapeutic, it has a curative effect. All plants radiate energy into matter, which we call food. Consuming carbon dioxide and excreting oxygen, plants provide the combustible gas by which we could not live without. Nature is man's laboratory, and many herbs have been found to provide relief from countless ailments. Most herbs contain several active ingredients. However, usually herbs are characterized according to one dominant constituent found in the plant, which may include tannins, which contain an astringent action and include witch hazel, eye bright and raspberry leaves, volatile oils which are found in high concentrations in highly scented herbs including rosemary, basil and oregano, bitters which are substances with a bitter taste may include dandelion root, burdock and golden seal, mucilages which are sugary gel like herbs such as marshmallow, comfrey and slippery elm, alkaloids or herbs that contain nitrogen include St. John's wort and comfrey, and flavonoids or bioflavonoids, two types of herbs which provide the yellow-orange colour in some citrus plants and include burdock and buchu. Many herbs can be ingested directly and quite safely. These herbs are known as aromatics, which simply means they smell and taste good. Aromatic type herbs are usually used in cooking and are found in almost every home in regular culinary spice racks. These may include cinnamon, clove, ginger, lemon peel or allspice. So how do we take herbs? The old system was that you might uh, cook up the herbs in some water. Uh, in the olden days they also took wine and they just steeped the herbs in the wine and that tended to um, extract more of the alkaloids or the alcoholic solvent uh, fractions of the herbal product. And the alcohol of course also preserved the medication because if you make a tea it will go off quite quickly. Now in modern times what we have is herbs in a bottle and so this is Siberian ginseng. That's where the root has been taken and a solvent which contains 35% alcohol has been utilized to extract the active ingredients but all the ingredients that are in the root and that 
provides us then this modern herbalist with a very easy to use liquid which can be combined with other herbs, say for the liver or for the kidney or for the thyroid, and they can all be put into one bottle. So one way that I treat people is by combining the appropriate herbs for that person's situation, mixing them all together in one bottle, and then I take a, a small draft. Now that would be from one mil to possibly five mils two or three times a day. The other way that we can treat herbs is again very much in the old-fashioned way. It's in um, a tea form. So you've got the dried herbs here and they have been mixed together. First of all they've been harvested of course, dried, cleaned, uh, screened to make sure that they are the right plant in fact. And then they can be packaged in the situation. And what we do here is we make a tea out of that and then we just drink the tea again two, three, four times a day as is appropriate for that person's situation. Another very modern high-tech way of prescribing herbs is in a capsule form. So here you have a gelatin capsule which contains the powdered form of the herbs. So in fact it's a step up from the herbal tea where you've got a coarser fraction of the herbs. That's where they've been powdered, put into a capsule and because we are such a pill popping society this is very favoured by a lot of people because all you do is you pop a few capsules and bingo it seems to give the effect. Along with of course looking at your diet, looking at your lifestyle factors and all the other issues we've talked about before. So there are various ways of presenting medical herbs to the people and sometimes the liquids are not appropriate because they can taste quite foul. Uh, for instance, if you're dealing with a child, you can't give them very bitter herbs because they just won't swallow it. But bad enough with adults, they already complain quite often. So we might have to be careful how we mix the herbs and perhaps add a bit of a flavoring agent like licorice to it. Even the licorice itself has a very therapeutic action as well. So. Dosages of the herbs, that is something we have to look at as well because there's this idea in medicine that we have to standardize our dosages. And one of the things that is often thrown at us as natural therapists is that, well, your products aren't standardized. A, that is no longer true because quite a few of the products have been standardized for one or two of the active ingredients. Secondarily, show me a standard human being. I've yet to meet one. So why are we so obsessed with standard doses? What we have to understand is that each person is an individual and each person at any set time is going to require a different type of dosage. Now medicine um, always comes in usually fairly heavy handed. It's let's start with a big whack of the dosage and if we get problems we'll just cut back. A good example being that of AZT. AZT was one of the first drugs that they had available for treating HIV AIDS and they started at 1500 milligrams a day. In hindsight, we know that that was actually a murderous dose. It actually basically murdered people because it killed them. It was so toxic that people died from the drug rather than from HIV itself. So that highlights our whole approach. Rather than start from a high dosage and then have to break our way down and perhaps cause a lot of damage on the way, our approach or my approach certainly as a herbalist is always let's start with a small dosage and take a few days, three, four, five days, whatever it might need for that person to build up to the dosage that hopefully they can handle. Now, if the dosage is too strong, what you'll find is they might get headaches, they might get nausea, they may get some gut aches, they may feel more tired, and that's simply the body being pushed too rapidly into a greater sense of balance. It may be throwing out more toxins than the kidney, the liver, or the bowels, or the skin can actually comfortably handle with. So it's not really a dangerous situation, but it is uncomfortable. So my approach is always start on a few drops or say half a mil and build up over a week to 10, 14 days up to a higher dose. And there are some people who never get up to the recommended dose because that's how the system is. And yet on that minute amount that they might be comfortable with, they're actually getting the therapeutic results. So that's all that matters for them. That is their so-called standard dosage. As medicines, herbs often are quite effective in alleviating many common ailments. Immunity can be boosted by immune enhancing herbs such as garlic, echinacea, licorice or ginseng. The nervous system can be strengthened with herbs such as vervain, skullcap or wild oats. The respiratory system, which is usually very vulnerable to environmental pollutants, can be strengthened with garlic, thyme or sage. 
the digestive system can be optimized with yellow dock root, burdock, arrowroot or chamomile. The urinary system, which performs the vital task of cleansing the body of waste products, can be strengthened with the treatment of herbs such as dandelion leaves, corn silk or skullcap. A depleted circulatory system, which provides a vital transport of nutrients throughout the body, can be enhanced with hawthorn or garlic. Bone, joint and muscle problems can be alleviated with lavender oils, rosemary oils, valerian, chamomile or ginger. The skin and eyes, our first line of defence against infection, can be strengthened with cod liver oil, skullcap or chamomile and an imbalanced reproductive system may be restored using herbs such as ginseng, wild yam or blue cohosh. Since the advent of AIDS and cancer, hundreds of herbs have been tested on patients suffering from these diseases in an effort to rebalance their immune system and either eliminate or prevent any AIDS or cancer-related symptoms from occurring. Although herbalists in the West cannot legally treat AIDS or cancer, many herbs have been found to alleviate the symptoms of such illnesses quite significantly. The following is a list of herbs which are currently being clinically tested on patients suffering from either AIDS or cancer. Bitter melon, known as MAP30. Aloe vera, containing the extracts kerosin and asamanin. Garlic. Lecithin. Germanium, an extract found in ginseng, shiitake mushrooms, garlic, comfrey and chlorella. Licorice, containing the extract glycerizin, and St. John's wort, which is also chemically known as hypericin. With HIV, we have a situation where a person has been infected with a particular virus, which medicine calls the HIV virus. And from their point of view, the whole situation of HIV is really that you catch the virus and that's the totality of it. So as long as you can hit the virus in some way, then you are supposedly also curing the situation. However, from our point of view as natural therapists, it's not quite as simple. Personally, I believe that the HIV virus is a component of the whole situation we call HIV AIDS. There are people like Professor Duisberg who believes that it has nothing to do with the situation called AIDS, and um, I'm not too sure about that. But from our point of view as natural therapists, there are too many other cofactors that need to be implicated or acknowledged as well. From our point of view, we're dealing, of course, with the concept of life force, and that's very fundamental, because when the whole situation arose 11 years ago, there was nothing in the books to tell us what herbs to use or how to treat these people. We had a situation with a completely unknown uh, disease or illness, so we had to go back to the very fundamentals of who we were as natural therapists, and that involved the concept of the life force. Now, a definition of life force is that energy that innovates a being and which in a sense distinguishes you from a corpse. A corpse has no life force. Some people have fantastically high life forces and you know those. Those are the ones that can do all sorts of things 24 hours a day and never tire. And other people have very little life force, they just go for a walk down the road and they're tired. So what we did was we looked at all the other cofactors that affected the life force aside from just the HIV. And traditionally there are quite a few. One of them is past history of disease. In other words, if you've had syphilis or gonorrhea or hepatitis, and obviously the treatments for those conditions as well, like antibiotics, it's going to weaken your body, it's going to weaken the life force. Um, you look at lifestyle factors. How much coffee do they drink? How much alcohol do they have? How many cigarettes do they smoke? How many drugs do they, they sniff or snort or pop or shoot or whatever? Um, how much stress are they under? So the mental emotional status of a person is another very important cofactor which determines how the life force is responding. So from our point of view as natural therapists, and this situation is also implicated if you like in any other condition, arthritis, cancer, whatever, we had to start acknowledging or looking at those factors that affect the life force and one of them of course is herbs. Herbs are very powerful in restoring life force. And so we started to play around with the various herbs that we knew could help. One herb, for instance, is that of um, echinacea. Echinacea is a herb that comes from America. It's been used there for a long time, particularly by the American Indians. 
that has a long history of usage in snake bite infections and so on. It seems to stimulate the white cells. It helps prevent, um, if you like, the spread of infection within the body. Uh, but we also look at the specificity of each person's situation. We don't just give them an immune booster because boosting may not always be the best thing for someone with HIV. What we're looking at again is that harmonization, that balancing. So that becomes the key word and the focal point for our whole treatment. But echinacea and a lot of other herbs, for instance, Siberian ginseng is another classic one here. They're what we call adaptogenic. These are herbs that have the ability to adapt or bring the body back to a state of harmony again. And by having a person come in with, say, HIV and finding out what is their specific story. Have they had hepatitis? Have they done a lot of drugs? Have they had glandular fever? Have they had amoebic dysentery? Or whatever it might have been. That allows us to specifically tune into what that person needs. Because everybody's needs are different. And if they have a lot of liver complaints, like they've had hepatitis A and B and C, and they've had glandular fever, which can also affect the liver, well, in that situation, you would really look at treating the liver, even though they've got an HIV situation, and you might think all they need is an immune booster. And in that case, what we might do is use something like the dandelion, which I pointed out earlier. Um, St. Mary's thistle is another very powerful herb that has a liver protective effect as well as a liver regenerative effect. And that becomes very important because here again we come into the concept of complementarity. If a person, for instance, has a very bad case of thrush, which can happen in uh, uh, HIV AIDS, this is a sort of fungal infection of the mouth and it becomes difficult to eat, it can become very painful. We have natural products that can be used in that situation, but sometimes it is so bad they might need a drug called ketoconazole, or nazarol is its other name, or fluconazole. Now these drugs work like a charm, like they usually do in the short term. But for instance, ketoconazole, or nazarol, or fluconazole can be incredibly damaging to the liver. So sure, now you've dealt with their oral thrush, and that might be under control, but now you've given them liver damage. So here comes that situation of complementing both sides of medicine. The doctor might give the ketoconazole, we give the St. Mary's thistle. And by doing that, we're getting the benefits of the drug without the harmful side effects on the liver, and that's a very important point. Other people have had, because of their excessive use of drugs, they, like speed and ecstasy and so on, they may have done a lot of damage to their kidney, and then we want to regenerate that kidney. And in that situation, we might use herbs like gravel root or just common old parsley, but it has to be done in a certain way. Um, if they've had gut problems, we might look at herbs such as hydrastis or golden seal. It is a fantastic tonic for the entire mucous membranes of the gut. And that's this herb, I beg your pardon, it's not. It's this herb here, golden seal. Again, one of the traditional herbs used by the American Indians. The American Indians were master herbalists, and they, they had a profound knowledge of how to use the various herbs in various conditions. And we as Western herbalists have taken that over. In cancer, you have the same situation. Um, it's not, first of all, legally, we're not even allowed to treat cancer as natural therapists. So we don't treat a person's cancer, we treat the person. That's again acknowledging, well, what is going on in that person who may have cancer? So again, they may have been, uh, for quite some time prone to gut problems or liver problems or kidney problems or heart problems or whatever it might be. And as the total thrust is at rebalancing a person, we have to honor all those specific needs in that person. So a person may come in with cancer and we don't particularly treat the cancer, we might just deal with the liver and the gut, the pancreas, the thyroid or whatever it might be. Thyroid, we might look at bladder rack. Heart, we might look at hawthorn. Kidneys, we might look at, as I say, past in gravel root. Um, for the gut, there are so many different remedies we can use, one of which is slippery elm. It's a very wonderful herb that can help to soothe a lot of the inflammation. And as a herbalist, I also use a lot of homeopathics or other substances like uh, vitamins, because they can also be useful. Again, with uh, HIV, for instance, if you have the need for IV pentamidine. Now this is if someone gets a, a very bad case of PCP, the pneumonia. Or if they get CMV, cytomegalovirus, they might need intravenous gencyclovir, which is a very toxic drug. And in that situation, we will give them high doses of vitamin C and again cover their liver with something like milk thistle, 
cover their kidneys or something like parsley or gravel root or birch leaves. And so get that complementarity going, get the best of both worlds going. Now in cancer, for instance, when they have radiotherapy or chemotherapy, they can get quite nauseated. And by using certain very simple herbs like ginger, ginger is a wonderful herb for that. And uh, we have it in the tincture form. The way we work as natural therapists, we, we have the herb, well, uh, these are companies that produce these products, but they get the raw herb and then extract the active ingredients out of that and that is then put conveniently into a bottle. And then from that point of onwards, we then combine these various herbs in set ratios that, well, that's part of being a herbalist, the art of herb herbalism. And then we prescribe that in a bottle to people and they just take a small draft once, twice, three times, four times a day, depending on the situation. Many herbs have been found to contain powerful healing properties. However, it is unwise and sometimes unsafe to treat oneself without thorough knowledge of herbal medicine. A number of herbs can be very harmful if administered incorrectly or impurely and may in fact aggravate the very symptoms they were meant to eliminate. I think it's very important to understand that when we talk about various herbs like these that they should be prescribed by someone who really understands them. Someone who has spent three, four years studying the specificities of each herb, how it is utilized, where it is contraindicated and so on. A little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And although I think it's a very good thing to encourage people to be as independent as possible and as um, self-prescribing up to a point as possible, it's also vitally important to understand that with these herbs, just don't go out and get some echinacea or get some ginger because you could actually do more harm than good. So it is important also that you go to a therapist who has a lot of expertise in a particular area. For instance, uh, cancer or HIV. There's a lot of therapists out there who have seen very few people with these conditions and therefore have very little expertise. So before you go to someone, check them out, see how long they've been practicing, see what areas they've uh, specialized in, and see what their overall status within the community is. I mean, do they have a reputation that is good or not? And then, of course, try it out yourself. So these herbs are generally very safe when used as prescribed, but uh, it's important to have them prescribed by an expert, basically, who understands exactly what your particular needs might be. If you can't afford to go to a herbologist to start off with, just do it for the once and understand the theory behind it, because anyone who's worth their salt will explain the workings of the herbs to their client. And I feel that, you know, to give people just licorice in their tea or licorice, 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 um, if the person hasn't already got a blood pressure, they're going to have one pretty soon. By just eating ordinary licorice, children in the past have um, had complications with blood pressure. And that's because um, with licorice, it retains sodium and excretes potassium. And people don't understand that. You can't just go on, like licorice that you buy in the shops is a totally different um, licorice that we're talking about. That's a sugar hit. And kids will buy that all the time. <laughs> but if we're talking about the real licorice root, then um, in my day and age, we could buy it in the shop also. And we used to chew on licorice root all day long because the flavor stayed in the licorice root. And I can remember quite distinctly my heart booming away there all day long, you know? And that was because I was chewing this licorice, which was really still nice tasting after four or five hours of chewing it. Poisons list is um, what the Therapeutics Goods Regulation has decided that uh, individual herbs, which are very workable herbs, given in the right dose, um, should be put on the poisons list. We can't use these herbs anymore. They have to be dispensed by GPs, who I find a really weird situation because um, I don't think that many GPs have botanical medicine um, diplomas or know too much about herbs. The legalities are that we will be totally illegal if we treat anything in the body. But if we give advice, then I think that's all we can do, which is all we do anyway. We only give advice. It's up to the individual whether they take it or not. So I feel that um, 
legal perspectives of um, where we are coming from has always been there. It's just changed its shape and will ever change its shape. But basically, herbalists will always survive because people ask for it. And if people didn't ask for it, then we'd fade away into the blue. But because people have a demand for herbalists, we will always be there. I think that you've got to be very open-minded and take the best of everything. You know, for instance, um, if chemotherapy is working for one person, then they must use it. But if there again they get any very bad effects from the chemotherapy, then they must make choices for other things, you know. And I feel that a lot of people today are getting very nasty effects from these different kinds of therapies that are traditionally used and um, choose to do other things. And um, I can understand their anxieties and why they make choices and in fact now have availability of using those choices and why they do in fact decide to do one thing as opposed to another. And there's been lots of evidence of that recently. There are certainly situations where a person's illness may have progressed to such a, a deep or chronic or intense state that it may need surgery, it may need some form of antibiotic, it may need corticosteroids, for instance. But as long as those are used at the appropriate time, and I feel with the backup of what we can offer with our natural therapies, you're going to get a far better result. For instance, in uh, HIV or AIDS, um, <clears throat> what I mean, there's one situation there where they can get PCP. This is the pneumocystis pneumonia, and it can kill. When they get to that point, I'm not going to say to them, just take these herbs and you'll be fine, because the patient will probably die. What they need at that point in time is antibiotics. But to be truly holistic, and I think this is where you put your finger on the word itself, whole, you have to look at the whole person, the whole situation, and then decide what is appropriate for that person at that time. And for that person at that time who has PCP, for instance, they need the antibiotics, no two ways about it. But then we can give them extra vitamin C to decrease the side effects of the Bactrim or the um, IV pentamidine. They can give them a lot of other vitamins that can uh, help to sort out the whole situation so that there's minimal side effects from these uh, therapies and maximal gain from the therapies and that the person comes through that whole crisis with the health as maximally in intact, if you like, as possible. And I guess, is there a healing crisis when you talk about using herbs? There can be, certainly. Uh, and I think this is one fundamental difference between the orthodox approach and our approach, because with the orthodox approach, so often the whole situation is one of suppressing symptoms. Let me give you an example. It's like driving a car and the red light goes on for the oil on your dashboard. Now you have a few choices, you can keep driving, and hope to heck that the red light just disappears, which it inevitably doesn't. Or you can get so annoyed with the red light that you break it. Or you stop the car, you look under the hood, and perhaps just add a bit of oil, and bingo, you can drive for many miles after that. Now what medicine does is, they are very good at getting rid of the red light. In other words, you've got a headache, they've got a headache pill. You've got a gut ache, they've got a gut ache pill. But it doesn't get rid of the reason why those problems are coming up in the first place. Now, as I was saying earlier, one of the major problems in, in, well, one of the major approaches, should I say, that we have with natural therapy is to try and re-establish a sense of balance or harmony in the body. Now, as that is done, if there are toxins in the system that need to be released, then the body will do that. And as that occurs, the body can certainly create uh, fevers, um, skin rashes, headaches, nausea, diarrhea. They are all symptoms, if you like, of elimination of toxins out of the situation or out of the body's uh, system. And it can happen quite violently if the person hasn't been taught or told how to build up their dosages. And that can be very frightening. It's rarely dangerous, but it can certainly be most uncomfortable. So I always make it a point to explain to people how they need to build up their medication slowly so that whatever balancing is occurring or whatever detoxing is occurring is done at a level at which the body can actually handle the release of those poisons in as comfortable a manner as possible. So the healing crisis or the detox reaction can certainly be um, 
a side effect, if you want to call it that, but it need not be if it's done with caution, if it's done with uh, prudence. The name of the plant is called Revolfia, or snake root. It's the Ayurvedic Indian herb, and it's been used for um, anxiety problems and blood pressure problems. And when they broke it down in the laboratory, they acted, they established all the active ingredients in it, and then they tested them independently and found out which one was the most important one. Out of the whole list of alkaloids that was taken from the Revolfia plant, which has never given any problems when given therapeutically, they took recipine as being the most active when that was given back to people, it certainly decreased the blood pressure, but it also made them suicidal. They would go into a very deep depression, and a lot of these people would commit suicide. Well, certainly suicide is one way to solve your blood pressure problem, but not a very effective one. So my point here is that, and there are many examples like this that I can give you, but that will suffice for the situation, that the whole plant product, the entire plant medicine, has a totally different physiological, pharmacological action in the body compared to just one isolated substance from that. And this is, of course, the situation with uh, symphytum or comfrey. They took one of those substances called a, a perlizidine alkaloid. If you feed that back at rats at very high levels for a long period of time, then you might get problems. But if it's given as the whole plant, it's no problem. Let me give you another example quickly. Potatoes contain solanine. It's an alkaloid. It is highly lethal. If you were to purify the solanine out of potato, you would kill someone very quickly. In fact, when potatoes go green, if they've been standing around for too long, the solanine content increases to such a level that if you then eat that, you can actually die. And there are numbers of people who are recorded as having died from potato poisoning. But I don't see any signs on the green grocer store saying that potatoes should not be sold or eaten. So it's the same sort of situation. So to come back to your original point, the poisons list, the dangerous list, is really made by people who have very little understanding of the real pharmacology, the pharmacognosy of herbalism. And out of their ignorance, extrapolate from an isolate what problems could happen from the herb. And really, there is no correlation. That's not to say that herbs, as I said, also cannot have dangers, but when used with knowledge and wisdom, which is why we get trained for three years as herbalists, then there is no problem. I feel that the word complementary medicine is how herbs have got into the mainstream at the moment. But, and this goes for nutrition as well, nutrients, supplements. Um, complementary medicine is becoming a very, um, how can I say, trendy thing to do. Um, I'm, I'm really opposed to um, the idea of using complementary medicine in that kind of instance just because it's trendy. More and more magazines are being published with the idea of use complementary medicine, um, which is a thing that I've been talking about that you use one and the other, the best of two worlds or the best of whatever world you want to use. Um, but when you get sort of people prescribing sort of um, one thing when it's totally inappropriate and this other thing should have been prescribed instead of, and we're talking about herbs or um, supplements when the individual doesn't know an awful lot about those things, then I think that it's um, a misappropriation of using those kind of therapeutics. If they have been trained correctly for the amount of years that it needs to um, prescribed individual supplements and herbal remedies, then I would agree. But I've found time and time again that um, clients have come to me and said, oh, I've had this because I was told to use this for this. And it's absolute rubbish, to be frank. Um, and I've said, well, you can use that if you like, but use this too, um, if you want to. <laughs> then um, they find that they're getting a little bit more benefit <laughs> from using the one that should have been prescribed in the first place. I think one of the fundamental things we have to deal with here 
is the different paradigm or mindset around healing. If you go to a doctor, talking generally of course, basically we're dealing with a situation where you can eat what you like, you can think what you like, you can do what you like, and when you get sick you just go to the magician who gives you the magic pill and that's the end of the matter. Although those magic pills can have positive effects on the body, they can also have a lot of side effects. So <laughs> there's a bit of a problem there too. But the point is that a lot of people have been trained, as it were, uh, to believe that they don't have to be involved in the healing process. So they come to us, they've got a problem, and now suddenly we tell them it's perhaps the 10 cups of coffee a day or the two bottles of wine a day or the 30 cigarettes a day or whatever it might be that is implicated in their health situation or in their ill health situation. And so to get a true lasting improvement, it is absolutely vital that we address those issues. But that's where it gets hard. Mm. Because it's easy to pop a magic pill. It is not easy to suddenly stop smoking, stop drinking, stop um, living in cafes or whatever it might be. And this is where compliance can become very difficult. And I guess the action of herbs is also uh, slower than, I mean, a pill you could probably know in a couple of hours if it works or not. Mm. But because they're slower, people don't, you know, they, they want a quick solution, I guess. That's, the, that's the other thing, I guess. They want a quick fix and no involvement other than popping the pill at the appropriate times. You know, don't talk to me about anything else, just give me the magic herb. And I do get people who come in and they want, the problem is, of course, they've usually been through the whole orthodox medical process, have failed miserably there, and now they want me to do a JC act. Well, it's not possible, you know, the, the way that the body has become unbalanced in the first place may have taken years. And it may take quite a number of months to rebalance that person again, plus, also needing a lot of their involvement by changing lifestyle factors and diet, as well as taking herbs and the appropriate vitamins or whatever else. Neither side has the total answer. We as herbalists can't fix everything, and neither can the doctor fix everything. I think we both have our area of expertise. And I feel that one of the fundamental things we have to do is realize that we need to be complementary to each other, not competitive to each other. That is fundamentally important. Um, I feel that if they want to find out more about natural therapies, they should start to do some reading, perhaps go for a session with a natural therapist or herbalist, and see where they, particularly in their situation, need to focus primarily. Our aim is, if we can, preferably, is to get in before a person gets sick. The aim is to be holistic, to be complementary, and to be preventative. In other words, certainly once the horse is bolted, we can fix up the mess that's left behind, but it takes a lot more effort, a lot more effort on their part, it takes a lot more time, and uh, as we said earlier, people often have problems with doing that. So it's very good for a person to go even though they feel they are well. Now, this is of course quite contrary to the whole mindset of how medicine works, because from the medical point of view, you stay away from doctors or from medicine as long as you are, in inverted commas, healthy. And it's only when you get sick that you go for help. And our approach is no. Um, there are a lot of things you can do simply and safely and relatively cheaply and easily that can maintain your health level at very high um, levels, if you like, and uh, with minimal input and with maximal benefits. But it's a matter of educating yourself and perhaps going to a therapist and just finding out a bit more from them on an individual one-to-one -one basis. Herbalism has spanned many thousands of years, only five of which have been recorded, but undoubtedly stretching back to the time when early humans first discovered plants as a food source. Even in recent years, the popularity of herbal medicine continues to grow in the West, even with the advent of modern technologies and medicines. The natural world, it seems, is a totality, with all its parts interacting in harmony. In a sense, all our lives are one, integral to the whole, and plants and herbs, which are thought to be the first offspring of Mother Nature, provide a vital link between life and energy, human or otherwise. 